I'll move around a little bit. I've got this portable mic. I appreciate you hanging in there for this last. We've been sitting all day. As they say, uh, sitting is the new smoking. So if you need to stand up during this time, that's fine with me. I'm sure Garth has a timer on his watch that he stands up once, one, uh, once every hour during the day. Uh, feel free to ask questions during the brief. I, I we'll get through the time, and we'll have question and answers at the end as well. But if you have something pressing, uh, don't be afraid to interrupt me. Um, as the introduction said, I wear two hats. I, I'm the advisor to air staff. In fact, um, not the greatest timing, but tomorrow I have to bolt out early in the morning to drive up to the Pentagon. We have to brief our chief of staff, uh, General Welsh, on questions on the fitness program that he has. And we're hoping it's, uh, he asked for discussion brief, so we're hoping we can, um, in, in professional, polite, courteous terms, educate him on some of the intricacies of the test. So as you, as you know, rumors abound. And one airman will ask a question, and then leadership will say, we need to fix this before we don't. Uh, my other hats are the Air Education Training Command. That's where we get with some of our battlefield airmen, working with those guys on the special ops side. <coughs> Old comic, but it works. I'm sure some of you might have been in this position before. In the Air Force, we're called the Chair Force quite often. It reminds me of the old, uh, I wish I had the comic. There's a picture uh, when it compares the services. It shows a poor army grunt sitting in a foxhole, worn out and tired. That's his TDY. Uh, and then it shows the Marine guy in kind of the same setting, except it's raining on him, so it's even worse. And then it shows the Navy guy sticking his head out of a porthole. But then it shows the last frame, the Air Force guy in his TDY sitting in his lazy board chair with his remote air conditioners blowing on him. That's, that's his TDY. So. There are differences in the services, but we do actually do some fitness work in the Air Force. Okay, what I want to cover here will be a bit on standards development and how we've approached it in a tiered fashion. There's a fair amount of talk about tiers today uh, throughout all the services now. We actually started this concept back in the 90s with our first uh, point paper on it to leadership in, in the late 90s, and we've gradually pushed it forward with, with real minimal resources since then. It, it's taken off in just the last uh, 36 months. We actually had a funded RAND Corporation study that looked at the first phase of a bona fide operational requirements process. Anytime we want as a military service to go with physical standards to the ultimate test of passing congressional muster, we have to have uh, to meet the requirements of public law. If you want to know the law, it's Public Law 160, Section 543, 1994. That's we, we have to meet that requirement for bona fide operational requirement study. So you actually go out and measure what the mission requires, work backwards from that to develop tests. So first, first step is task analysis, second step is develop tests, and third step is validate those tests that predict success at the mission. And that's really tier two, and I'll talk about that later in our brief here. Tier one, similar process, but there what we're trying to do is is instead of an occupational criterion, the criterion for tier one is a health criterion. You say, well, why do we care about health? Well, health care cost is significant. Uh, in fact, we have 2,000 data, so that's 13-year-old data that showed in the year 2000 that 7% of the Air Force Surgeon General's budget went to those that were in the bottom 20% for fitness and fatness. So aerobically unfit, and excess body fat do cost us. It not only costs us in health care, and that, by the way, that's health care costs while active duty, not retiree. All right, so you say, well, that 30-year-old staff sergeant, he's going to be fine. If he's unfit and over fat, he's not fine. So the, the, and uh, the other point on those, two points, is we also found that those airmen are least present for duty because they're sick. So who's making up for them when they're absent from duty? Those that are fit. And so we get, and th then you start venturing into the, the overlapping Venn diagrams of injuries for, for those. So that's what we're going to talk about. And focusing our, we try not to boast about this per se, but we can say that the Air Force today for the aerobic and body composition component has a criterion science-based fitness assessment. Okay. So let's talk about developing standards, and then we'll get into the tier one. Our goal is to have this kind of hierarchy, improve the health and fitness, both currently and in the future. Try to improve the culture is what our leadership grabs onto. And we follow the hierarchy that for the health criterion, aerobic is most important by far. In fact, it's very important to note, 
Aerobic fitness is most important by far for both health and performance, both tiers. And, and we, we'll, I have a matrix picture to show at the end on that one. Secondly, on the, in the tier one health picture, body composition is next most important. And then thirdly, muscle fitness. That order changes in tier two, and it changes when you get into specific occupations. But the bottom banner there uh, runs a bit contrary to old teaching. You'd rather have someone who's fit and lean than someone who is fit and fat, but you'd rather have someone who's fit and fat, somewhat fat, than someone who's unfit and lean. That unfit and lean group tends to get lost sometimes. Uh, that's that uh, uh, 06 at the Pentagon who's overworked, hasn't worked out since he was a lieutenant. And you look at him in uniform, you go, well, he doesn't look too bad. He's kind of thin, in fact. Remember, thin does not equate to lean. Those are two different things. I'll talk about this a little bit later. But that person is his aerobic, anaerobic, muscle fitness is too low to be as good as the fit and fat guy. Now, don't misinterpret the term fat there in the second one. There's a certain point where there's diminishing returns. And we'll, we'll talk about those thresholds. And of course, the last category is the rich. All right, components of fitness, classic definitions supported from by ACSM, NSBA, all your textbooks from primary school to university will show the five health components listed here, and I already told you a bit of a hierarchy for the, for the health tier. All right, skill components, which, don't, which have a much greater genetic portion than the health components, those six listed there. All right, those combined make up what we would call total fitness. So tier one, we're going to focus on the top five. That's where we get our bang for the buck on absenteeism, health care costs, et cetera. And that will be all airmen for us, all, your entire force. Tier two, we're going to look at increasing the magnitude for most, not necessarily all, but most career fields. You'll have to increase the magnitude of the test if you use the same test. For example, uh, for a, uh, a young airman under age 30 in the Air Force, the minimum aerobic standard for a mile and a half is, is 13 minutes, 36 seconds. VO2 is high 30s, low 40s. Not, not outstanding, but it's enough to keep them out of the hospital. And, and keep him present for duty. But we shift the magnitude to the right, we jump all the way to our highest standards, that's for our pararescue entry men, uh, pararescue men for their entry standard is 947. So you're looking at almost four minutes faster. There you're shifting to the tier two side of the house, which will encompass all components, as you see here. All right, standards development, the traditional, and I don't want to pick on sister services, this goes all the way back for all services. Obviously, we're the youngest service, but it goes back. The traditional model is to take a 1,000 soldiers, stick them out in the field, give them a fitness test, and then get a bell curve out of that. And you find your you know, guy that did zero push-ups at one end, the guy that did 100 at the other end. And then you have to tell leadership to look at it and say, I, I want the pass-fail to be the 10th percentile. And that's, that's the traditional level that it's done. And that's why if you're ever checking standards, you can always tell what we call the AO effect. The action officer at the Pentagon, some 404506 was under pressure from the general to come up with the standard, and they write something that looks like this, 1430, 15 minutes, 1530, you know, nice round numbers, or 40 push-ups, 50 push-ups, something like that. And you say, that's probably a dead giveaway of those nice round numbers that there aren't criterion references behind it. In fact, a good evidence that when I first uh, wrote the basic training standards for the Air Force, the passing time for the men that we used was 11 minutes, 57 seconds for the mile and a half run. And a two-star general came in there and he says, well, Neil, let's just round that to 12, make it nice and easy. And I said, with all due respect, sir, let's not round it to 12. I'd rather stay at 11.57 so it shows that we actually put some thought into this with some science reference behind it. It actually relates to a VO2 we want these guys to be at. And he, he got that. The light bulb went, he said, oh, okay, versus the nice, neat round number. And that's the typical history we have. Not, that doesn't mean you're out of the ballpark, but it tends to mean that there hasn't been as much of, of the science behind the standard. The other problem with the, norm, with the normative curve is you got shifting sand. Let's say I'm in the 50th percentile for heart disease in the United States. That means I'm probably in the 15th percentile for other regions of the world. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm that good. All right? So not having a criterion reference, a baseline, is, is challenging. And most of our standards today are still normative. I know Brian won't want me to mention, but the, even the Marine Corps combat fitness test, yes, it's highly related combat, but it wouldn't pass congressional muster. None of us can pass congressional muster if we don't have a criterion reference. So that's what we did. We moved beyond the normative to criterion science-based standards, again, for just the aerobic and body composition components, but those are the two big boys. And 
and the health of the nation. And our next generation is to move on to the tier two. So again, here's, here's a, a nice simple way to look at this. I, again, if we were standing before Congress defending this, we could defend the tier one because it is evidence-based. It's, in this case, gender dependent. Why? Because a female does not have to score as high as a male on four of the five major health components to get the same health outcome. A woman with a VO2 of 35 is roughly the same health risk as a, as a male of about 39 ml per kg, close to. So just to give an idea there. So it is gender dependent. There are differences between the genders in tier one. When we shift to tier two, the toolbox on the flight line or the missile that's being loaded on the aircraft doesn't say, ah, here comes a skinny, weak male or a small female. It doesn't change. It weighs what it weighs. You, the task has to be done. And you've heard about that earlier in the day. This is a nice, simple way to lay it. We've got the first one done for the big components in the Air Force. The second one's where we're headed. And that's a big chunk of work to do. Kind of a visual depiction of this. This is a health tier one standard. You can put any fitness parameter on your y-axis there. And then across the x-axis, you would have males in the, in the blue color and the, the females in the, in the purplish color there, no, showing just what I said earlier. And what I did at the bottom is I grouped the AFSCs, or MOSs for, for the other services. The idea here is it doesn't matter what your MOS is. You're occupationally independent. But you're, you're going to be uh, gender specific here. Everybody's got to meet that standard. When you switch to a tier two, now those that are in the higher physically demanding career field, group four, those are going to be likely for us, it would be our pararescue men, our combat controllers, the special ops guys will be here. Firefighters, uh, certain aspects of SF would be here, and pretty much the rest of the Air Force. Frankly, the Air Force is going to go pretty much like this and then curve up. The other services have more of this linear shape because you have other MOSs in the intermediate category than we do. Again, we're, we're probably 85% sedentary, to be real frank about it. In some ways, it makes my job easier, except this part's going to be really hard to do. Right. Then someone asked the question, well, what about that personnel officer who does nothing you know, physically demanding until they deploy, and then they're throwing sandbags? Well, the idea would be maybe we could come up with that general standard that would be here somewhat above the health standard, and that's a to be determined, inherent to the military profession. So that's an overall scope of the standards we're talking about. Let's move on to tier one, and I'll break it out across the components. We do know from the literature, and this has been in since the 80s and 90s, is very well established the strong relationship between aerobic fitness and health risk. All right? There's also a, a very strong relationship between central ad obesity, adipose tissue in the, in the abdominal region, central fat, and health risk. All right? Both of these relationships are continuous, which makes it very difficult to come up with thresholds. And they're linear early, and then they get very curved linear at the higher levels. I'm not worried about a guy gaining one inch if he's 30 inches in his waist going to 31 as much as I am the guy who goes from 40 to 41. Both change one inch, but big difference in health risk change. Right? This is our challenge for us in the services, to come up with dichotomous thresholds. We can say that's the fail cut point. We can't just use the 10th percentile. We've got to use some criterion. It's hard to do that when you have a continuous line relationship that these are. Okay, so we looked at a lot of references. We worked with folks at the Cooper Clinic. Uh, which has the best database uh, recognized by ACSM for this relationship here. Right. So we set the th thresholds, then we develop test methodology, because remember, you can measure VO2, you can measure uh, body composition in myriad ways. Right. And that helped us with a defensible foundation. And in the process, we added this middle amber zone to our process. Most standards have just pass-fail criterion, and that's fine, but when you're talking health, what you want to do is a lot of the populace, they'll, they'll say, they'll finish basic training or some initial type training, and they'll say, I'm as fit as a fiddle, and they go on. Even some of our battlefield airmen get this. They still think they're as fit as they were before. As someone mentioned that earlier today, the brain remembers, but the body has changed. What the amber zone does is it gives a warning. A real simple example of that is, uh, males under 35 inches are in the green health risk, low risk zone for Air Force men. A, a male who's over 39 inches is in the red zone. Between 35 and 39, they're in the amber. It's a warning zone, just like a traffic light. Hey, you're up 36, 37, 38, time to start changing your behavior and work back down. If you're in the red, it's time to you know, halt, clearly do something about it. And this is what we're trying to get, uh, you know who's honestly the hardest AFSCs or MOSs to convince of this? 
believe it or not, it's the SG community. No offense to the medical folks out there, but they have a hard time understanding some of this. We're trying to work with them to get them to communicate it. Because everyone's taught, well, before I exercise or before I start a diet exercise program, I go see my doctor, right? Yeah, they can clear you of some major health problems, but a lot of them, and I'll share a study in a little bit, uh, 2007 study actually did a fantastic job of finding out how educated our physicians are. And they did this worldwide. They interviewed uh, 100 physicians, 400 lay people, and 100 at-risk patients in 27 different countries. And I'll share the results of that in a little bit because it points out that issue with the SG community. So this, I, this amber zone, back to that, it's, a, it's an identification of the creeping health problems that are so common in what we use a nice term, service member life cycle. Just to, people in the general populace and in the military. Remember, we mirror the general populace, right? And it gives you a very positive here. All your health promotion efforts should be focused in this area, not all of them, but a significant portion. It's much easier to intervene on someone who's creeped into the amber zone and get them back into the green than it is to try to spend a lot of stuff telling that 48-year-old E8 who's been doing the same things for 25, 30 years as far as exercise or inactivity and poor dietary habits and maybe other bad habits with tobacco and so forth mixed in to say, you need to change. He's going to look at you and say, go take a hike. All right, so let's try to get him in here. Grab that 28-year-old staff sergeant or captain and, and try to work on him. You've seen this probably earlier. I saw this in another briefing earlier today. They probably stole this from us. All right, aerobic standards rationale. Uh, I mentioned the health risk relationship. We use VO2 as the common currency. And we use the well-accepted uh, longitudinal a ACLS, aerobic center study since the late 70s. Uh, Ken Cooper wrote his aerobics book in 1968. He did his original data on, on Lackland Air Force Base Airmen uh, to come up with a 12-minute test, run around the track for 12 minutes, and then we'll, we'll measure where you stop. That became logistically problematic, so that's where he switched over to the mile and a half. It mirrors a good 8 to 12-minute time frame for, the, for a good laboratory VO2 test. Okay, it's well recognized by the ACSM. Cooper Institute reviewed our program, and I'll mention that in a little bit. The further support of the body of literature. This is the best thing to do. Try not to put all your eggs in one basket. Look at the whole body of literature, and we did do that. Bottom line is the runtime predicts VO2 max. VO2 max is clearly associated with health risk for a myriad of issues, as well not only physical but also cognitive you'll find that. When you work with the special ops community, you really want to know that. Simple example of that is we had one of our uh, officer courses, and the, the passing time was in the nine-minute region. Those that were just passing it, they're bent over at the. They had a situational awareness scenario, and they did a run test and they embedded it in the scenario. Those that that passed the test by a minute or more, they finished the test and had, still had enough physical reserve and mental reserve left to handle the the scenario that was thrown on them and make good decisions. Those that barely passed, they were still passing, but barely passed, they did a poor job in the cognitive decisions immediately following in the scenario. So it's not just avoiding disease. This is uh, the hard science done by Steve Blair back in 1989 and repeated in 90, 1995 and in several publications since. He's one of our leading exercise epidemiologists that I think some of you are well, well aware of. And this is just the simple findings that said, as I lower my fitness level, my mortality rate's going to go up. And for males, the big finding here is, yeah, it got worse as we went up, but the big finding was the change occurred primarily here at the lowest fitness level. The statistical significance isn't up here. So the answer was, hey, you don't have to be the Olympic athlete super fit guy. You got to be just get off the couch to get health benefits. Obviously, the uh, uh, a special ops type person is going to be up higher. We want them up higher for mission reasons, tier two reasons. But for tier one, let's just get our soldiers and airmen moving. Don't let them be sedentary. That's been well known for some time. And these are the data behind it. Very similar for females, but a significance at both the bottom two quintiles. So what we did is we went into these quintiles and worked with the Cooper Clinic. Instead of just using a quintile, well, what is that in VO2? We looked at the data and came up with actual numbers. So we came up with our thresholds in this area and in this area. That's the basic, not rocket science behind it, but it's solid science. So this is a very nice depiction of our aerobic scoring system. We actually developed the standards in 2003, but we had folks at Air Staff who didn't translate the science into the scoring. 
for the airmen. That's where our problem came about. So if we look at the aerobic picture, and I'll show you the same thing for body comp, here are your points awarded. This is on a 50-point scale. We now have a 60-point scale for this, but th that's not the key point here. Here's your health risk, and this is your green, amber, red health risk line. Notice fairly linear in here. So I can go from 10 minutes in this particular, this is males, 50, 59. You, why do you do that? Whenever you brief generals, you show them their age group and so forth and ask about. Uh, they go from 10 and a half minutes all the way to pushing 14 minutes, and the health risk hardly changes at all. A few percent. But when they start going 15 all the way into the 20s, a lot of change, curve linear. So actually back in 2003, my oldest son, who was 16 at the time, was much better in math than I am. He's now a practicing engineer doing very well. I said, how do I trans translate this health risk into points? Because typically what will happen is your science is in the VO2, which is predicted by the runtime. How do we get the points from that? Do we just say, well, let's put 100 up here, zero down here, and, and fairly distribute it? No. That's what we don't want to do. And I'll come back to that in a second. What we want to do is do the mathematical corollary, just flip it. That's where the blue line comes in. If I'm low risk, I get the most points. If I'm high risk, I get the least points. So we had two big changes. We had a nice, smooth, mathematically correlated to the what? Matching the score that you get on the test to the true out criterion outcome. The black line depicts what the old scoring system was. Notice it's fairly arbitrary. It gives people who are super unfit points. <laughs> and it has no relation to the health criteria, even though we had to handle it differently. So when we showed this graph to our senior officers, th their light bulb went on with this one. They said, my goodness, who designed this black line? And we had, that's where you, we didn't point fingers, but they will ask those questions. Right? So the old system, notice it rewarded people. Wait, now look at this. I mean, that's, quote, running 25 minutes per mile and a half. I mean, do your math on that. That's uh, eight minutes for a half mile. That, that's really unfit people. But yet they were still scoring points. They may have failed the test, but they're still being rewarded that. So we changed that part and we matched it up. And, uh, and notice here the new scoring system. Here's the 60 point scale, but you just use the apple to apple 50 to 50 here. Notice how this is a classic, quote, fairly distributed type situation. Here, your points don't drop off very much in the green zone. I go from 50 to 42 basically in this zone, only eight point loss as long as I'm in the green area. Why? Because you don't change your health risk much. I just drop off a little bit. But I drop off a ton amber and red, why? Because my health risk starts going way up. And so the, the U.S. Surgeon General, the previous one, he, he called me up and said, hey, you know, I, I'm looking at the point chart, because they don't see the health risk. I'll show you in the next slide. He, looked, he, he said, I don't think these are very fairly distributed. I said, with all due respect, sir, that's right. We don't want it to be. And I sent him this slide, and we talked about it. He said, okay, got it. He supported that. So again, it's a communication issue often. So the airmen, they see the runtime. They see this, low risk, moderate risk. Unfortunately, they don't see it in color. And then they see the points. But this is the science piece behind it. This is your health risk. I just showed you in the curve, and here's the corresponding VO2. That's male, and this is female. Same concept. And the hard work is drawing the lines in here. That's what we, I explained earlier. So for the aerobic picture, no matter what your test is, and different services choose different tests. The whole idea is to predict the common currency. The common currency of VO2 is related to health risk. And then use that to come up with your points. And we've had very positive outcome of this. Whoa. I just went all the way down. I apologize for that. Got to go all the way back up here. slides folder and go back top, I apologize. So that's our aerobic picture. Any questions on that? I'm going to go into the body comp now. If I can get this back to the top. And I can go easily slide sorter down here on the bottom. There it is. I see it. There we go. Okay. Push the right button next time. All right, body composition. I don't know what service he's in. I, I think that was a Navy pool. Um, sorry. All right, 
body composition. One thing we're going to try to do with our chief of staff tomorrow is help him with the delineation between body mass or body weight and body fat. Uh, we have to be really careful when we use the term weight. In fact, here, this is a, I pulled this out of an article. I really would like to see our, especially our SD community, but the general populace move away from overweight to over fat. We, we have a lot of good operators who are overweight by the ideal life insurance actuary tables. We want them to be, we want them to have that lean mass. We care more about whether or not they're over fat. All right, so when you're working with your audiences, make sure you delineate between body composition and body mass or body weight. All right, first off, it's a major physical fitness component. You say, well, of course, this audience knows that, but you'd be amazed at how many of the soldiers and airmen don't. They, you know, in fact, that's the one reason we're briefing tomorrow. We had our chief master sergeant in the Air Force, unfortunately, not understand this, and he's been spreading false state, making false statements about, and it may be just because he doesn't know it, he's been saying, well, let's just decouple. Let's just get that body composition out of there, and then we can get people passing the test. But he doesn't understand there's a very intricate relationship between body composition and the other fitness components. I can just look at our advanced circumference scores. The higher the advanced circumference, the lower the aerobic score, the lower the muscle fitness score. There's a correlation there, very powerful. So over fat is the way we like to say this, and obesity pose health, performance, and cost problems. All right, I've covered some of those already. All right, this is a big misconception. Uh, Vivian Hayward on New Mexico did a great job with this. That body weight is more important than body fatness. It is not. People focus and, and delineate here on thinness and lower weight rather than on leanness and what the composition, what's that body made of. Right, that's very important. You could be thin but unhealthy. You could be thin and not be able to perform. So thin is not necessarily, you know, the skinny Madison Avenue model is not the person we want to put a rucksack on. We got a pretzel if that happens, all right? Lean, fit, low, low in body fat, uh, that kind of person right here may be over ideal weight because of higher levels of fat-free mass, what we want them to have. And I'll just say it right now, I worked with an outstanding pararescue man. He was six foot, 220, 225 pounds body mass. So his BMI was 34, somewhere in the, in the low 30s. His Air Force flight surgeon didn't counsel him, didn't guide him. He ordered him in writing to lose 40 pounds because his BMI was too high. And I went on runs with this guy. He could do six-minute miles for two, three miles. He could throw barbells around like popcorn. And this guy was the guy you want in the helicopter pulling you out of the drink. And he came to me just absolutely frustrated and he thought his career was going to be over because of that. Question right here. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So I saw this guy, you know, I worked out regularly with him. And, and so that's part of this education, you know, and I, I shared earlier, and this we're going to share with the chief tomorrow. We don't really have a science problem, a standards problem, a program or a methodology problem. We have a perception problem. And I waved that flag in 09. It's really hard to do it. And that's an education and marketing. A lot of us in the science community say, okay, we did our science work, hand that over, and we press on to the next task. We forget that if we don't communicate that very well, then we, then we lose, the, lose the picture. All right, so we right now no longer use measures of stature and mass. The old days when I was a young active uh, officer, the, we had the MAWs, maximum allowable weights, and they came right out of the 1959-1983 life insurance tables. And, and so his story fits right in with that. I always knew when my boss, who had troubles with his, his MAW things, what his, when his annual test was coming up, because two weeks before, he'd be running up and down the hallways. He wasn't doing it to work out. It's because he was taking diuretics to get underneath his maximum weight. And two weeks later, he was a frazzled health risk disaster. But, you know, then the next 11 and a half months, he would go back to his bad habits. Right? So BMI is not a body composition measure. We have to be careful of that. It works in the general population, and I'll cover that real quick. All right, so body mass, or body weight, you can use the old MAWs. It just tells, it in the Air Force, all it does, in, in our opinion, is help the load master how much weight's on his aircraft. Otherwise, it doesn't do anything for us as far as fitness and health. But here's a key point, and we could even ask this populace. How many of you weighed yourself on a scale, I have, in the last, sorry, in the last uh, week, at least once in the last week? How many of you measured your BMI at least once in the last week? How many of you know your actual percent body fat? A few of you. And how many of you know your abdominal circumference? Most of you men can say, I wear such and such a belt and probably figure that one out. Ask that to your general audiences and you'd be surprised. 
because most people are stuck on this. Well, one, it's a simple reading to do. If you can own a bathroom scale. I weigh myself daily because it helps me figure out what my hydration level is, just roughly. Say, well, you know, I didn't hydrate enough after yesterday's workout. I'm not going to feel so hot today. But I'm not going to stick on it for body composition. Okay, BMI I've already talked about. I think you're familiar with most of these. Here's an Air Force study we did with over 5,000 uh, Air Force blue suitors, active duty, and 30, almost 30% 30 of them were misclassified. 20% of that were those that were I described earlier right here. They're, they're high fat, free mass, low fat, but they were called overweight or obese by BMI. Then the other ones are that 06 I mentioned earlier, the guy that's unfit, hasn't done anything in a long time. Those are the ones that slip under the radar. It won't, be, it won't have records like he has. They'll say just fine. But that's a guy that's a health, high health risk. All right, here's another. This is a good proof of, of BMI. These two individuals have same height, same weight. I call it my marshmallow slide. We had a problem, I had this up in our lab, and the folks came around concerned about inappropriate figures. It had more to do with, you know, don't hang Playboy things up in your, in your picture like some people were doing. And they said, you gotta take this down because this guy's wearing a Speedo. I said, well, I, I'll take it down. I'm, I'm just glad that this guy's not wearing a Speedo. <laughs> All right, continue with the hierarchy concept. We move out of the body mass picture into the composition picture and the most classic measurements are percent fat. And now we're getting somewhere. Now we're splitting the body into two basic compartments, fat-free mass versus fat mass, and we get a measure of total adiposity, which is a much better measure for health than the, than the weight measures are. And, and, and we know that higher adiposity, people are at greater risk. The DOD methodology is two free tapings for this, two male, three female. Okay. What it doesn't tell us, though, is how the body fat is distributed, so what the fat pattern is. So here's a key line. Individuals can have the same stature, same mass, same BMI, and even have the same percent fat, but I do not know who's at the higher health risk because I don't know where they're putting the fat, and that's important for us. So a better measure is to measure central adiposity. And again, I'm probably repeating the preach of the choir here, but why is this important for us? The intra-abdominal, not the fat that you squeeze, not the stuff that you're grabbing a hold of. It's inside, and I'll show you a picture of this in a second. That fat or visceral adipose tissue is the, the very problematic fat. It's associated with a myriad number of diseases. And it also has some gender specific, specific issues to it. It's very labile, first off. That's why it's risky. The fat in that region, it's, it's a good creative design. It's fat that's stored there, so like, it's like your carburetor. It's, it's readily available for energy in a car. The problem is if we're not using that energy through activity, then it's just gonna keep building up. And then it's, then it's available to the circulatory system and hence your increased cytokines, increased cholesterol, triglycerides, et cetera, and your diseases. Okay. So the pro for a male who tend to have more of this, the pro for a male is because the labile fat's there, it's easily added, but it's also more readily lost. So if I have a husband and wife and they go on the same exercise diet program, matching their calories, matching their activity exactly, two, three weeks into it, the guy might even be able to adjust his belt a little bit. Say, hey, honey, look. Meanwhile, she can't fit into the dress anymore because her gluteal femoral fat, which is different than the visceral fat, is not as labile. And so if he doesn't watch what he says, he could get smacked. But um, the, the pro for the guy is he can lose that quickly. The, bad, bad, the negative is because it's labile, it's very associated with disease. For the female, the pro for her is the gluteal femoral fat, it's basically closed off. Now, the bad news is you can't lose it, but the good news is it's not associated with the blood, therefore her disease risk is, is nowhere near as bad. All right, so those are pros and cons, the classic apple gynoid um, care pattern. Sorry, I'm showing you my screen. So how we measure it, you're familiar with these. Percent fat, there are myriad ways to measure. Our Surgeon General's office spent eight months trying to find the black box back in 2008, 2009, trying to find the best way to measure this when we were saying, well, little low cost measure of abdominal circumference, we're gonna measure the central adiposity as well. That's the beauty of it. And that's hard for some people to conceptualize in the technical oriented society. They say, well, I've gotta have something fancy, a $35,000 bod pod or a super expensive DEXA machine. And those are all fine, but they still only give me total adiposity. Some DEXAs can break out subgroups. But I can't do that for 400,000 airmen. It's too costly. Nor can I do CAT scans or MRIs to get the visceral fat measure. But the abdominal circumference has a very strong correlation to the amount of visceral fat. So that's the beauty of using that. And this is depicted very well. This slide alone 
convince a two-star general who was adamantly against the Donald Trump company. And I didn't even talk to him about it. It was his chief mass chart note there. So CAT scans or MRIs are the best way to measure, and that's what this is. Here we have an individual. You can see the subcutaneous fat on the, on the posterior side and here. There's the umbilicus. Here's the spine. The dark tissue is, is muscle and a little bit of organ tissue. The mottled stuff in here is the, is the bad stuff, the visceral fat. That's what we're concerned about. It's right there where the portal vein is, dumps it out. All right. Here's another individual, same type of measurement. You can see the subcutaneous fat between A and B is pretty similar, actually. The spine, obviously, is very, very much the same. Muscle tissue is stretched out here, but it's roughly the same amount of area. But the visceral fat here is 120% or 1.2 greater than, than the visceral fat here, even more than that, I'm sorry. So this person is a much higher risk. And the simplest way, you just do an AC measure of that compared to that. And that, that kind of gives you an idea. So you can spend all day pinching this, but it's, it's what's underneath it that's important. Positives of Downward Circumference, I already mentioned a few of these. It's very correlated to VAT. I showed you that in the picture. Independent of BMI. That's important for you when you apply your exercise science program. You don't have to worry about the, the BMI. It's clearly superior to BMI and waist to hip ratio. It's a stronger predictor of multiple health risk. I'll show you a table on that in a second. It's one measurement, vice the 2-3 taping. Very reproducible. Unrelated stature. This one is a difficult one. It's not conceptual here. I spent 35 minutes convincing the six foot seven two star, went on to become the academy superintendent, good man, and he said, "Why, why do I not get a higher threshold?" She said, "I'm six foot seven." I said, "Well, if we go back to that picture, what's at the L4, L5 iliac crest level? What's there? Spine, intestines, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, and a little bit of muscle tissue. The only change in that for a mature male, which is pretty much 99.9% .9 of males after age 22." Only change in there is going to be minor amounts of change in muscle, but most of the change is going to be in visceral fat. So I asked the general politely, I said, when you graduated academy back in 1973, what was your waist? And he stood there and he said, well, I was about a 29 and a half, 30. And I said, fantastic. So what are you today? 34. I said, well, that's still good. That's in the green zone. You're fine. But that change from 30 to 34 is primarily fat change. Now, he's still in that low risk zone. He doesn't have anything to worry about. But it's not because he's six foot seven compared to the smaller guy. A, a meta-analysis of major studies, multiple major studies of over 7,700 subjects showed that stature had only 0.5%, a smidgen, of the variance of the relationship between abdominal circumference and health outcomes. So we don't need to worry about it. You just have to communicate that real clearly. And that L4, L5 is below the organs that are of different sizes and different heights. Okay. It's generally age independent, and the problem here is for a given abdominal circumference, an older individual is going to actually have higher VAT. So if, if, if I have a general that says, hey, I'm over 50, you should allow me to go, instead of 39, I should get 40. And I say, well, honestly, because of that fact, you really should be 38. That, of course, that's not going to be very palatable to them. So we're, we're consistent across the ages there. Very good for assessing fat content before and loss. I mentioned that earlier, just pulling on your belt. Okay, members can easily track it. You can have your spouse measure it for you, a friend, a fellow airman. This is a key point. Uh, it's, it's very practical. Most people readily can identify, just look at your belt with AC, whereas computing kilograms per meter squared for the average airman isn't, isn't a daily thing. Okay. okay, so the impact of over fat. And this last one's on military bearing. AC measures that pretty readily. That's the L4, L5 I was talking about. I don't use the slide ever, very often anymore. We had a group of uh, squadron F-15 fighter jocks who made fun of the, the arm on this guy here, said he was reaching inappropriately. So you've got to be careful of your audience. Uh, this is the chart I was telling you about. Uh, give credit to Captain Ken Yu, uh, re uh, no longer with the Navy now, but he's a fantastic researcher with Air Force Navy data out of Uniform Services University. These are conditions that are associated with excess abdominal obesity. All right, not total adiposity, but central adiposity. Okay, and here's the linkage, and the, the level of the association. And you can see a lot of stuff. Believe it or not, sleep apnea is one of the major um, conditions for retirement physicals now. You're getting a lot of people getting that, upwards of 100% disability because of that. And 
be interesting to see how many of those that are at their 20 to 30 year retirement out of the military and they're getting this diagnosed, how many of them have this strong association because they have high abdominal obesity. It'll be interesting to look at the data. Okay, so here's a nice good slide for your leadership. You put up two, two uh, airmen here, uh, very s relatively similar for stature and mass, therefore they have relatively similar, similar BMI. I have no idea who's the healthier one at this point. So I go ahead and I measure their percent body fat. And again, myriad of ways to do that from calipers to DEXA to whatever. And at this point, Jones is probably, because the total adiposity is higher, is probably of greater health risk, but I need to measure where that fat is stored so I'm going to measure their AC, and I find out here, this guy, despite higher total adiposity, has less in the central area, so he is of lower health risk. So there's just, again, a nice hierarchy put it there for you for your leadership. Okay, so our rationale behind this, we had several citations that we used to help us to come up with the thresholds we used. We did not use, um, and, and uh, I know the Navy mentioned this earlier, we did not use the NIH. Um, our primary paper was an excellent paper done in 2002 by Zhu et al. Uh, and they make a great statement in their paper saying that where the classic 40 inch and 35 for female, where this comes from is it was the secondary measure. What they did in, in the NIH is they said what's the BMI based AC threshold. So they had BMI connected to health outcome, which is nowhere near as strong as AC to health outcome. They used the, the former to come up with, they said, oh, by the way, here's the AC for that. We went directly to what AC connects to health outcome. And that's where we came up with our 39, 35, 39, green, amber, uh, amber, red for males, and I'll show the chart on the next slide, and 31 and a half, 35 and a half for females. So we focused on the direct relationship between AC and health outcome, independent of BMI. Okay? And we used the, this, this publication as an excellent equation that helped us develop our curve. And we supported it with a body of literature, all right, which tells us that for every centimeter increase in the balance circumference, one's health risk increases. As I said earlier, gradually linear, but then eventually becomes curvilinear. All right, we use the body of literature for this to come up with our threshold. And this is the, here are the cutoffs right here. And this is what we'll be explaining to the chief again tomorrow when they ask us, where did 39 come from? It's interesting to find 39 is starting to appear more in the literature for males and actually for females. In fact, this study here, I was concerned when I set these thresholds that th if, if anything, we're finding in our data that these are well supported and these are probably a little too benevolent. And this study here, a 16 year prospective study, very powerful of over 43,000 women, and I have the reference if you want it showed that increased uh, disease risk increased progressively from AC values starting as low as 28 up to 35. So if anything, we should tighten these down, not become more liberal with them on the female side. And another excellent study with uh, several thousand males done by Zhang et al. Uh, showed that values starting at 34 on up. So we might even have to tighten this one down a little bit. Of course, that's hard to get across when we're just trying to keep, keep what we have in there. So this is the same curve that I mentioned earlier, and this one's even more convincing than the aerobic curve, and that is same health risk picture. As your downward circumference increases, your health risk goes up, and here's your corollary blue line we formed, and here's the old black line, and this was really egregious because it rewarded poor behavior, it did not reward good behavior. In fact, I had a, a young tech sergeant I talked to who found himself to be 40 inches. And he said, I gotta do something about this. You know, I don't like all this fat. And he went on an excellent diet exercise program and several months later came back and he got down to 35 inches. And you know, you want, the squadron commander should be pulling him up front saying, you know, here's our poster boy for doing a good job. On the old point system, he went from 40 inches, got 21 points, all the way down to 35. So he went from red all the way down to green, doing exactly what we want him to do. And the old system went from 21 to 22. You got a whole 1.5 points on a 100 point scale. So he had a 58% reduction in health risk, but he got 1.5% reward. So what he told me when I showed him that, he said, forget it, I'm going to the club and having a beer. And that's exactly, I'm quoting from him. The new point system that we put in here following the blue line, he would have gone, he would have gotten gone from 16 points all the way to 30. So significant 
actual, actually given him what truly is happening as far as his criterion health outcomes. So we got away from that block line there. Okay, and then the green amber, same thing. First warning, time to take some action, prevent further gain. If you're in the red zone, it's a, it's look at it as a second warning. You really got to do some risk reduction. Same thing here. The airmen see the inches, the risk, and the points. The health risk ratio right here is what they don't see, but that's uh, what I just showed you on the curve. That's male and that's female. So that's it for the body comp. Let me finish up with a couple things and we'll have time for Q&A. Muscle fitness, go through this quickly. There's very limited research. I'm open if anybody has any news. Of, of I, at, at the time we did this, there were only five total publications that had any kind of connection between calisthenic type tests and health outcomes. How many push-ups should Sally do to avoid osteoporosis later in life? It's just not, it's not funded research. It's not, not a lot of people are asking those questions. So we're really in the, in the muscle fitness calisthenic based type testing, we're really forced to go with normative here. So this is the, the two components on the test, push-ups and sit-ups that we can't, we can't use criterion data, we don't have it. So we simply use the ACSM manuals for this, the Big Cooper database, and we set our pass-fail cutoffs at 50 for push-ups and 60. We try to put a little more emphasis on the, on the sit-up than the push-up. Push-up is not really a very great occupational test, frankly. Um, we went to get rid of it, but it doesn't score very high in some of those areas. And what we did do is fix the scoring system. The old scoring system, again, was very egregious. On sit-ups, if you did uh, about one-third the work, you got 70% of the reward. It was horrible. It disincentivized trying to push for excellence. The push-ups were even worse. If you did 18% of the, of the maximum, you still got 70% of the score. So that old black line was, was horrendous. And people were very worried when we showed this to leaders, and this will happen to you if you present a new program to leadership. They'll say, what's your pa fail rate going to be? I'm worried about failing too many people, especially if the report it's going on their performance reports. And we projected upwards 20 to 30% fail rate. And sure enough, the first month we introduced the new program in July of 2010, we had a 22% fail rate. But we told them, don't panic, because the masses will move to the standard. And they did. Less than six months later, by Christmas time, we were down to 12%. By a year later, we were down 6 7%, and today we're around 4 5 5%. So what happens? The masses, even with some cheating, manipulation, data entry problems, whatever, when you got 400,000 people, you get them to move to what you want, a new, healthier, safe standard. Okay. So the test, I already showed a lot of this, was vetted and reviewed. We had uh, a blue team. We had an, an original team of exercise physiologists, uh, two excellent prev med physicians worked with me, and we developed this, uh, Vince Fonseca, who is now the Texas State Epidemiologist, and uh, uh, Anthony Robbins, who's now the, the head of the California Cancer Registry, two outstanding guys, wish we wouldn't have lost them. Um, then we had a separate group led by an 06 and consulted with Captain Ken Yu, reviewed the program. Another team reviewed it, the blue team within the Air Force. Then we went outside to the Cooper Institute, went through all that. Then we, we red teamed it within the Air Force, just to the, to the airmen of all levels, senior levels all the way down to young airmen. Uh, to do, and that's your communication education piece. Um, and we've got a publication in draft for this. Okay. You've seen this one before. So what's our way ahead? In the tier one, uh, it's taken a while, but we actually have our hands on the database now, so we're looking at some research in this area. Uh, we're gonna continue to try to, to monitor the results and connect the outcomes with health risk, injury, illness, and other problems in the tier one picture. And we're just now starting some of this and we're excited about that. Uh, the fitness standards, we'd love to move away from order to criterion. That's a, that's a big challenge and it's probably not gonna be front burner, honestly, with other things coming up. And we're considering new test modalities in the tier one environment to try to, to address other movement patterns, bend and twist, squat, pull. These, these are both for health and for, uh, for tier one or for tier two. Aerobic protection is something to keep in mind. A lot of attention, and even more of my slides went to body comp than went to aerobic, but aerobic still is far more important for both arenas, all right? And one of the, within the tier one, the, the sense of aerobic protection is the literature clearly says that higher levels of aerobic pr protection, uh, fitness give us protection from actual gains in 
visceral fat independent of BMI and even independent of total adiposity. Okay, how does it give you that protection? Not by reducing total mass, you won't hardly change on the scale, but you will reduce your VAT and some of your subcutaneous and eventually some of your total by increasing aerobic. So this is the message you gotta get to the, to the airmen and the soldiers. Mitigate your elevated risk. That's why we allowed people to score up to 20 maximum points if they were 35 inches per man, okay? Here's a biggie. So long-term health benefits, get your folks that focused on fitness, improving their fitness and reducing health risk. How? Increasing physical activity rather than relying solely on diet alone. You gotta do the two together. But if you had to make a choice, activity is the best one. All right? What I wanted to do is say you get your green maximum points in body composition if and only if you're in the green zone aerobically. That was too complicated in 2010 when the chief wanted to introduce a simple program, but we're still gonna not give up on that. Questions tomorrow are, can we do it if we're red and green? If someone's 39 and a half, 40 inch male, can we say that, well, if they're green aerobically, we'll allow them to pass. At this point, I don't have any, enough in the science to say that we can do that, let alone the fact that I don't want people with large visceral fat accumulations out on the track trying to max out their run and then keeling over, then we'll get back to deaths due to the mile and a half, all right? So back to the hierarchy, where does the road protection come in? If I have my two guys, what if in this sample that they were both the same abdominal circumference? Then how do I know who's the healthier? Right now, this tells me they're the same. So then I'm gonna go to the most important component and that's aerobic fitness. This guy has a faster run time than this guy, so he has the lower health risk. That's why we weight the test 60, 20, 10, 10. So culture change is what the leadership is looking for, and we want to advance the program across both tiers. So real quick, let me wrap up with the way ahead in tier two. Um, there's an excellent article, I encourage you to look it up. It's done back in 2005 by uh, Mercer and Strzok, uh, Naval Community, and they put together a, a nice theoretical article to explain how we need to change our thinking from classic types of PT and, and adapt it so that we're looking more at occupational. And a couple of bullets to make, here's a big one. Focus far more on pulling and core fitness than pushing, but what's the ubiquitous exercise in the military from every basic training? Push-ups. With the, with the uh, athletic teams I coach, I use push-ups only for, I use it a little bit for exercise, but I use it for distance. You know, late to practice, that kind of stuff. I never use exercises I want them to embrace for lifestyle. Crunches, running, other things. I don't use that for, for discipline because you want them to have the association that they'll keep doing it. All right? Multiple planes of motion, good article to look at. All right? So we are now pressing ahead with research and development into the BFOR work to come up with performance tests and standards across this, these components but also across the skill components. All right, we've had good briefings. We completed the first phase of the project through the RAND Corporation white paper study and this study was completed prior to the current political environment of the, of the WISR, or what is now known as the WISP. And just this past week, and that's why I'm a bit fatigued today, we spent a lot of time into uh, launching the WISP, and I have meetings next week at the Pentagon on that. That's the program being pressed by the SEC staff that we heard about earlier today. Okay. In the near term, we're gonna try to do a little bit of functional fitness testing, looking at uh, the other movement patterns and other energy systems. With uh, examples would be a cross knee crunch which gets bending and twisting, squat gets the squat leg motion, and a shuttle run. This is the matrix I was talking about. It kind of helps visualize this, and I'm, I really want to show this to, to the chief tomorrow. Once you understand the tiers, here's your health. We, we've got this pretty locked in and this pretty locked in. And those are your top two, 60%, 20%, and then 10% for the other two down here. And then these, I throw in stability, mobility, along with flexibility. That's your functional living kind of stuff. And these are your skills, agility, balance, coordination, so forth. Tier two, aerobic's still most important. Body composition, not as important as it is over here, but still here I care more about total adiposity. So a tier one test, I'll measure AC for a pararescue, and then I'll measure his total adiposity over here. This I'm saying, hey, watch, if he gets high here, then I'm concerned about his health. If he's got too much total adiposity, I'm concerned about, it was well put by someone earlier, today he's carrying too much weight. Uh, I'd rather he carry equipment instead of his own body fat. That's the measurement here. Muscle fitness become moves up to very important here. So this would be one, two, three in order. This is very important, stability, mobility, well done. And then skill, back to your question, Brian, would depend on the specific skill set of the, of the AFSC. 
And we're trying to change the attitude. Instead of the guy going to the gym and saying, I'm working back today and I'm working legs tomorrow, instead I want him to go to the gym and say, I'm working what kind of movement pattern. And this is a prioritized order of movement patterns. And we don't even test number two, three, or four right now. And we limit test number five. That's only for a BA. So that's a problem in the military. So this is a kind of an all-encompassing nice little slide. So like I said, we've done this one. We've got to work on this one. This is my last slide. Uh, the areas we've made progress in over the last, goodness sakes, 25 years, but especially in the last 10 years, we can say we do have science-based standards, criterion standards for the, the two I mentioned earlier. We've, we've got the body composition measures. They were done by the Hawks, then by fitness assessment cells, and now they're back to, they're not back to the squadron, which we at least avoided that to avoid biases. So if, if Garth and I are in the same unit and he says, hey, buddy, you're going to measure my AC for me, right? And it's really, you know, he gives me a number really low. Not, we're not going to do that. Um, but we, we lost this, the funding for this. We did get rid of the use of BMI. We have not made as much progress in these areas. We want. This is the one I like to focus on a little bit. Military services are required by the, the DOD to measure annually. Most of us now do semi-annual, which is much better than annual. I suggested this to our previous chief of staff, and I got cut off by the Surgeon General <laughs> for separate reasons. But one of the greatest successes, it's not well known, in the U.S. Air Force when it comes to random frequency is, is the drug lab that was put in place in 1975, post-Vietnam, when we had upwards of 12%, 13% drug use by airmen, and it was common across the services. Today we have about 0.02% or something. And a big reason for that is random. You never know when you show up at work and there's the pink slip. Well, in my days it was a pink slip. Now it's an email. If you get and say, you got to report to the drug lab within three hours and you know, be in the cup and we're going to test you. Imagine if you had the same email that said, you have 48 hours to report to the fitness center to take your fitness test. And think of the behavior that would change. We would no longer have that the guy I mentioned earlier, that boss of mine, that for 11 and a half months he had a horrible lifestyle and then he'd cram, cram for two weeks, injure himself, get sick, diuretic, all that bit to pass his test if we had random. So that's still on the table of something we'd like to do. Um, but if you ever present that to leadership, you've got to have your logistics and your whole program ready to bring that up. But that's a new one. Uh, you asked about machines earlier, Brian. Was that, was that one part of your question? Yeah. In 1999, we actually designed a machine-based test for the, for the Tier 1. We had a lower body, core, and upper body set of machines. What's nice about that is you eliminate a lot of the size and gender biases, and you eliminate a lot of the cheating. You know, is it the chicken peck push-up? Do you go up and down? We had, you know, it gets rid of a lot of those arguments. You, you can literally put on a weight stack, use a machine because it's sim simple, avoid, you know, you don't need to get into free weights for this. I don't mind if they do free weights at the gym. But for the test, you can put an LED where the t test administrator, he can be doing the machine. All I care is that it goes from the bottom of the stack, goes up, and he covers the range of motion X number of times at, at the appropriate weight for his, for his, his gender. Um, that, that we had that design. We had it ready. It, it fit into an 85-square-foot pattern. Would have easily fit into all of our hawks, big broom closet size. And it would have been $8,200 per base. There was a upper body was, was, a, was a rowing motion, which is more, first we started with bench, but that's so not, we don't want to stress bench. There's too much bench press, frankly, in my opinion, in the military. You know, we do not want to exacerbate what the computer sitting desk does already. That's this, you know, <laughs> we want this. So we had both a choice between a row and a lat pull down. We had a simple ab machine, which isolated the abdominal, just a simple bend. It wasn't an extensive amount of motion. And then a, then a leg press. Real simple, just the idea isn't trying to have an all-encompassing test, but something to, to stress those regions of the body. Uh, I would try to transition to movement patterns today, but keep in mind this was 1998, 1999. Got it through the Surgeon General, approved it. He said, go finish development. I'll come back to me in six months. We went back to him. In the meantime, the, his staff had undermined it and put calisthenics in place. They just they took the rug out from under us, and I won't get into the politics of that. Push-up sit-ups. And a year after they did that, the senior leader who did that came back and apologized profusely and said, worst mistake of my career, he was retired at the time. So that's how close we came to that. Will we ever come back to it? We might. Tier 2 is actually the way to get back to it. One of the advantages of putting machine based in for Tier 1 testing is it gives you a platform for Tier 2. But you don't want to restrict yourself to it. What few seconds we got left, I'll answer any questions and I'll stick around. Any, any questions on any of this stuff? Thanks for sticking in there at the end of the day, folks. <laughs>